The scripture reading this morning is from the Epistle of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And if you'd like to read along in the Bible in your pews, that is on page 950. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Will you please join me in a word of prayer? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, there comes a time in most of our lives, and we probably know this by about age five, when we're faced with having to make a big decision and we've reached the end of our resources to do it. Maybe we've used all of our education, a large part of our wealth. We've talked to all the experts and contacts we know. We've read books, we've watched videos, we've listened to podcasts and lectures and and sermons, and finally we must act. In the fullness of time, or depending upon particular circumstances that press in on us, we have to make a decision and take the next step forward. And when we do that, when we make that decision, we're saying yes to something and no to something else, or maybe no to several things. And while our intellect might seem to point clearly to something, so often I think we base our decisions on some deeper truth that may or may not be in alignment with that reasoning that we've done. Maybe something emerges from deep down, from our heart or our gut, that shines like a diamond in rich earth, and it shatters our intellect and it tears apart all of that painstakingly arrived at answer. And regardless, though, regardless of how we've come to that decision, we take the next step in trust. We take it in trust because, of course, we can't know the future. Nothing's guaranteed. Or is it? In this morning's scripture reading from the letter to the church at Ephesus, which may or may not have been written by Paul, by the way. There's scholarly disagreement about that. The author writes this. I pray that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. My sermon topic today is God Beyond Reason. And I'm not going to be talking about the process of discernment or making a decision. That's for another sermon. But what I want to do today is simply to stress to you and to help all of us remember that in every decision we make, in every step that we take, Christ is with us and in us, even when we fall short, even when we make mistakes, even when we hurt other people, even when we feel thoroughly confused or scared about what lies ahead, Christ is with us and in us, at work in us, individually and as a church, so we may grow deeper 
in love for God and love for each other, and also to grow deeper into our fullness of our human nature, ourselves with a capital S, the gift of ourself. I love that answer from the children. That's the promise of this letter to Ephesus. We remember that no matter how big the decisions we face, no matter how big they are, Christ is in us and with us. And after we take that next step forward, we know that there will be more big decisions in our future that are going to lead into unexpected directions. When I think about this, I'm reminded of the astronaut Alan Bean. Some of you might know that name. He died this past May at the age of 86. Fascinating guy. He was a crew member of the Apollo 12 lunar mission in 1969, and he was the fourth human being to walk on the moon. And he got his start by studying aeronautical engineering in college, and then he went to the Navy where he flew jets, and then from that Navy service, he was chosen in 1963 at age 30 to be an astronaut. But it wasn't until six years later, in 1969, that he finally got his first opportunity to go into space as part of the Apollo 12 mission. I'm sure some of you here can remember when that happened. Amazing. And after the Apollo 12 mission, he went on to spend almost two months in space aboard the space station Skylab in the early 70s. Can you imagine spending two months in space going around and around the Earth? Amazing. And then after that, he was on the short list to participate in the then beginning space shuttle program, which NASA launched in the mid-70s and the first flight started to happen in the late 70s. Alan Bean was there. He was ready to take that mission. But he chose another path. He chose another path. He said this about this decision. The more I thought about it, the more I realized there were young men and women at NASA in the astronaut office that could fly the shuttle as good as I could or better. But I was the only one interested in trying to do this other job. Well, the other job was to become a painter. See, when he was taking aeronautical engineering in college and learning to fly jets, Alan Bean was taking painting lessons at night. And in 1981, he retired from NASA fully to become a full-time painter to the point where he's now known almost more for his paintings than he is for his achievements in space. And if you've ever seen these paintings, they're amazing. They're these beautiful lunar landscapes just of the craters of the moon and of astronauts that have this wonderful prismatic color to them. They're really awe-inspiring to me. So he made this decision when he had this opportunity to go further into the NASA program. Was his painting career beyond reason when he had this other opportunity? For some of us, it might be. But you can tell by those paintings of Alan Bean that he discovered a deep joy in himself and in the creative process that allowed him to grow further into his own fullness as a human being. And by the way, to paint a painting, much like flying to the moon or starting a new job, moving to a new home, moving to a new school, saying goodbye to someone or saying hello to someone new, like all those things, all, in all these things, we trust that when we begin that journey, we're gonna be a different person after it's over. I'm sure in both space and on the ground, Alan Bean spent a lot of time in quiet reflection as he made his decisions. And that certainly, that's what the author of Ephesians was doing when probably he wrote this letter. I don't know if you noticed, but this whole passage today from Ephesians is a prayer. It's a prayer, and it starts this way. I bow my knees before the Father. I bow my knees before the Father. This means that he got down on the ground on his knees 
prostrated himself. And this was significant because when this letter was written, probably in the late first century BCE, the standard way to pray as a Jew was to stand with your arms kind of like this and palms up. That was the standard way to pray. But this author, by saying, I bow my knees to the Father, is saying something very significant. He's saying, I'm getting down into this prayer, and I am humbling myself before God. Total submission to God in the contemplative prayer process. Have you ever thought about the position in which you pray? Maybe your prayer style is to, is to sit with your head bowed and maybe your hands folded. Maybe it's to stand like the Jews of the first century and to hold your hands out like this. I once knew a man who liked to pray walking around and rubbing his head like this. I don't know why he liked to do that, but it did something for him. In the Augustinian tradition, when priests are being ordained, they're invited to completely prostrate themselves before the chancel of the church. They lie down, face down into the floor, spread their arms out to echo Christ on the cross. And it signifies complete submission to God. You know, even seeing other people pray in different positions, I think, can unlock something in our own contemplative practice. You know, every time I visit my mother in North Carolina, I walk into her dining room, and she has this beautiful painting hanging. It's, it's pretty big. It's like three feet tall and two feet wide. And it shows what I think is a simple pilgrim girl on her knees, simply dressed with kind of a bonnet on, and her chin is pressed to her chest, and she holds her hands out like this. And to me, that represents simple humility. And I need that reminder every once in a while to completely bow in submission to God when I pray. And by the way, speaking of paintings again, paintings and other works of art, or the contemplation of symbols, I think is a very important help to connect us with God beyond our reason. There's power in symbols that can lead us, in the words of the author to Ephesians, to help us comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of God's love in Christ. I love the way you read that, Jonah. Just think of those words, contemplating the breadth and length and height and depth of God's love in Christ Jesus. Think about how we can do that with the aid of symbols. Think about even our sacraments of baptism or receiving communion. These sacraments, they're literally the outward and visible sign or symbol of an inward grace. They're beyond words. We're not capable of completely describing what's happening in these sacraments. Though, of course, words and word pictures can also help us contemplate God beyond reason. I think every religious tradition has its stories that help us take us out of our own heads. One of my favorite in the Zen Buddhist tradition is about uh, a university professor who goes to Japan and he visits a Japanese master to learn about Zen Buddhism. And the master invites him in the house, invites him to sit down, and the master starts serving him tea. And the master pours the tea into the cup, and he keeps pouring and pouring until the liquid gets to the lip of the cup, and then the liquid starts to pour over the top of the cup, and the master keeps pouring and keeps pouring and keeps pouring until finally the professor says, you've got to stop, what are you doing? This cup is absolutely full to overflowing. And the master said, like this cup, you are full of your own opinions and speculations. How can I show you Zen unless you empty yourself. Then there's one of my favorite of Jesus' parables. Very short parable from Matthew, where Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys the field. 
That's it, end of the parable. I think these can be head scratchers for us, like my friend who patted his head when he was praying. They can be head scratchers, but they open us up and get us out of our own thinking and reasoning to contemplate God maybe in a deeper way. When I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon that sometimes when we make big decisions or small decisions, we rely on our intuition sometimes over our reasoning. I don't mean to suggest here that we should follow our own instincts willy-nilly because the writer of Ephesians elsewhere in the letter is very clear that we live in a broken world that is broken because too many of us rely selfishly on our own way. We can get in our own way and we can get in, our God, in God's way. We rely on ourselves to fix things and not God. We can puff ourselves up. Also in this letter, though, is the great Reformation verse. By grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. This is not of your own doing. It's about God and not about us. But as we make the decisions, as we go through these pathways in our lives, God wants us to grow deeper into our fullness. And God has given every one of us unique gifts to share for the building up of the saints to serve in ministry. The author says it's to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That's our purpose in life, friends. And when we can get in alignment with that, we are going to experience a fullness and a joy and a delight that gets deeper and deeper as we serve God. Let me close with the two final verses of today's passage. It's the end of this prayer, and it's a doxology. It's a, it's a hymn in praise to God. Hear these words. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.